I want to thank Audible for their support of the festival and these conversations. We really appreciate their, their support and everything they do. Thank you. I speak, yeah. <laughs> I speak for the entire programming team. That I think that we we are really privileged to provide a platform for all kinds of issues that are very important. But considering the temperature in the country and the state of the struggle that we're all in, we're just really grateful to be able to have space for filmmakers, artists, and activists with such close ties and history, work, to working around reproductive rights. This promises to be a impactful conversation, and I'm looking forward to hearing it, as I'm sure you all are. At this time, I'm, I'd like to introduce the moderator of our conversation, Ashley Finley, who is a writer, activist, and birth keeper based in Salt Lake City. Thank you. Hello, hello. Is this thing on? <laughs> I am so excited to be here today. Um, this is my first time at the Sundance Film Festival, and I couldn't imagine a better way to have a first. Um, so I'm gonna introduce our amazing panelists who you are all here to see, um, and their amazing work. Okay, so first we have Tracy Dros Tragos, <laughs> director of Plan C which is filming, or premiering tomorrow at 2.30. <laughs> um, next we have Francine Coital, co-founder of Plan C. Um, we have pa Paula Isalt, director of Under God, and one of my favorites, Aftershock. <laughs> And then we have Tia Lesson, um, director of The Janes, and Emma, P oh, I'm so sorry, Pildes, <laughs> director of The Janes, another one of my favorites. It's so great to be here with you all today. Um, and I believe we have some clips from each of the films that we will play and right now. <laughs> In 1972, abortion was illegal. It was a front line. Women were literally dying because they were women. So we thought we can be of use. We had the phone numbers on bulletin boards. Pregnant call Jane. We were all being watched. Sometimes they're unjust laws that need to be challenged. can't do this, this is actually illegal and you're, they're going to come after you and do you, have you got your LLC? How can you protect your, your, your house? Uh, how come your husband lets you do this? Are you sure you shouldn't be firebombed? Are you sure you don't have security in your house? Have you put up cameras? I've heard this all my life. You cannot run and hide with a bully. When you call the bully on their bluff, they don't come after you. The only way you get out of dealing with a bully is to stand up to a bully. You're gonna be the one who successfully stops me? Ha, huh, no fucking way is Texas gonna be the one to gets me to stop talking about what I know is an, a justice issue. At 17 weeks, the fetus was diagnosed as incompatible with life. We made the decision to terminate, and that is rooted in Jewish identity and law. The Dobbs abortion decision is an attack on church-state separation. The Supreme Court's recent ban on abortion violates the religious freedoms of Jews and Muslims, both communities that allow for abortions. It's like saying, you know what? Now we're gonna push fundamentalist Christianity on everybody. Can you use the Religious Freedom Restoration Act in these states to defeat the abortion laws? So are you gonna use RFRA only to protect fundamentalist Christians? Or do Jews get to use it too? A law that started as envisioned just for the right is now the tool that we need against the abortion bans. 
The strategy is to create a momentum that will spread these lawsuits to other states. There is work to be done. <laughs>
it's not over, and I'm just inspired to be here with these incredible women. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I <laughs> when our when our film premiered, you know, last year at Sundance, it was the 49th anniversary of Roe, and we said, you know, that it may be the last time, you know, that Roe um, was celebrated, and people thought, no, that's not right, and and in fact, that's what happened, and. I think um, as we've had the chance to, to, to show our film around the country, we've, I've been buoyed by the incredible, um, creative, resourceful things that are happening out there and the spirited young people and intergenerational dialogues that are taking place. Um, and, um, and I also feel somber because I understand that this moment right now is disproportionately impacting low-income communities and communities of color. Um, and, you know, hopefully the Dobbs decision is a, ha, has been a wake-up call, yeah. and we need to keep moving forward. Um, yeah, I mean, some days I feel hopeful, <laughs> some <laughs> days not. Um, we were talking about the effectiveness of hope, the importance of hope in organizing um, and in doing this work and how you need that. To, to move forward. Dr. King talked about the importance of hope in organizing. I mean, this is a long held belief. So um, in that spirit, in finding the hope in this, you know, and, and, and in talking about these films, it, you know, it is to build on what you're saying, like that in times like these that, you know, people find their own personal power mm -hmm. and they use that power to organize and that's how we affect change and that's how we fight back. And we saw that in the Janes and we're seeing that now and that's a really hopeful thing to remember that this is um, part of the human condition is, is hope, so. <laughs> yes, I, I really love the highlighting of hope and resilience but also this kind of fighting spirit, right? Because I think, um, Francine, I also do appreciate what you said. I do believe that, you know, <clears throat> the course of history has shown us who, like, that we all we got, essentially, right? And that, um, that we take care of each other, we keep each other safe, and that um, when the systems fail us, as they do and as they ha have always done, right? that we, it, it's time for us. What did you say at the oh, photo call? We were taking photos individually, and I'm like, it's really hard to stand like by yourself, but once we get to the group photos, it's like, ah. Oh, yeah. And it's kind of like, it's better together. <laughs> it's better together, right? It's so much easier when we are together than it is when we're like trudging this like uphill battle alone, right? So I appreciate you all for highlighting the hope in the moment and also this like we can't lay down and take this and we haven't and we won't <laughs> right um so with that i i guess i want to ask i was watching um in preparation for the panel right i was watching your other film abortion stories like women tell mm -hmm. and one of the uh women really stood out to me and she was one of the women who like organizes on the pro-life side and she was talking about her name is Anne, and she was talking about how she went and stood in front of a planned parenthood building right and in the word planned she saw them <laughs> okay <laughs> she saw her name Anne, in the middle of the word planned and so her exact words were God, is that you telling me to get in the middle of this? So the thing that struck me about that, right, is that oftentimes when we encounter people on the other side of the fence, right, pro-lifers, whatever, they always have this, like, really defining moment of, like, no, this was, like, divine intervention, right, that I ended up here. And I think that's tends to be what drives them to be so like, whew, potent <laughs> is the nice word that I'll choose <laughs> in their work, right? So I wanna ask, what was your Planned Parenthood moment, right? What was the name in the word that 
was like, I have to have this discussion. I have to come to the table on this, if there was one. Well, I mean, with, with Francine, it, would, it was, and Plan C, it was meeting Francine in 2018. Uh, Kavanaugh was appointed to the Supreme Court. The writing was on the wall that Roe looked like it would be overturned, and the question that I wanted to try to answer was what were folks doing to prepare? What was, you know, how was this gonna work? Uh, and, and what was the sort of answer back to that? And I, I reached out to Francine like on LinkedIn, of all things, like I found her there. I was doing, you know, all the crazy ways you find people, but I, and you were willing to, you answered right away. Like you usually have to wait a long time. And Francine answered and we met for coffee. She lives 20 minutes from my house uh, if there's no traffic in LA um, and yeah. That was the beginning of the and, and we met and that was the beginning and it was really the way that she spoke about the promise of abortion medication and telemedicine and online provisioning and you know you can get all everything ordered right to your door and, and it can be private and it can be discreet and I spent time with that film you know at, at, at clinics where people had to pass through the gauntlet of protesters and the trauma of that and, and just realizing that people could be in their home, you know, and it could be, you know, really private as it should be. I just blew my mind. And then COVID hit and, you know, the film, uh, that Francine's work and the work of the organization of Plan C really took off. Mm -hmm. So that with this film was, yeah, those were my two aha moments, meeting Francine and then COVID, the sort of promise and, and what that, yeah, so that's my answer. Yeah. Well, since we're talking about filmmaking and documentary filmmaking, the genius of this woman that four and a half years ago, she recognized... My, my mother is clapping on the couch. Ago, <laughs> that's the only clap for her. My mother. But seriously, when you make a doc... I, mean, I don't know if you've... I, I watch documentary and I think, how did they, that person know to start filming this little girl who ultimately ends up winning some award? Mm. How come she was already documenting that? This was the strategy. You're talking about the eagle huntress, right? Yeah, the yeah, eagle right. huntress. That I never understood how somebody. But anyway, the, the genius, the, the strategic understanding of the fact that we were on to something with Plan C was oh. why Tracy um, contacted me. The, the bit about, yes, uh, if, I hadn't, if we hadn't met and liked each other as much and trusted each other as much, the, the whole journey of that trust together. The answer to your question about my moment of what got me to do Plan C with my partners, um, it was in Ethiopia. I was in the highlands of Ethiopia in the year 2014, and I was doing an evaluation of uh, three countries for the MacArthur Foundation in which we were looking at the impact of giving out misoprostol for postpartum hemorrhage. Misoprostol is one of the pills that you use for abortion pills. Turns out misoprostol will save you if you're hemorrhaging after you've delivered. And we were looking at these. Anyway, we, being who we were, we went into the every single little pharmacy, a little drugstore in the highlands of Ethiopia, mind you, one of the poorest countries in the world, and found the abortion pills. Mm -hmm. The abortion package of abortion pills with MIFI and 4-MISO, beautifully packaged, coming from India, $5. No doctor, no nothing, go to this wow. drugstore, get this pill, and you can take care of your needs of if you have an unwanted pregnancy. We come back, my partner and I, Elisa Wells, who's the other co-founder, and we, it was 2014, the first time that Texas had shut down because of the antis who had shut down and were waiting for the Supreme Court to you know, open the whole, whole women's health clinics again shut down access to abortion in the US, in, in Texas. And I'm like, what the, you know, it's like, okay, time to take care of things at home. Yeah. How are we going to get the word out about the fact that there are these safe, effective pills that everybody else seems to have access to, and in our country, we don't know about it, we don't have access to it, we're gonna start getting the word out. Mm -hmm. So that, to me, was that bit, it was the dis discrepancy between what I knew could happen with evidence and what we were experiencing here politically in this country. Yes. Thank you for the question. Oh. Thank you for the answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the moment, the aha moment. Well, there wasn't a moment. Hmm. 
necessarily, but it's a journey. And um, as Ashley, you said in, in the beginning, it's really important to contextualize where all this comes from. And abortion rights is part of the larger reproductive justice conversation, which is part of the larger maternal health conversation. Abortion care is the same thing as maternal health care and health care. Mm -hmm. It's not like, you know, we have birth and maternal health and abortion. Right. It's all one loop. So um, as a mother of four, and I've had my own adverse birth experiences, you know, abortion is something that I know how important that is personally. Yeah. And um, and then, as you mentioned, Aftershock, a film I, I did last year about um, the U.S. maternal mortality crisis, that we are right now in crisis. We are the most dangerous country in the industrialized world to give birth in. Mm -hmm. And black women die three times the rate of white women. And when the Dobbs decision came down, that was essentially saying, we're going to force people to have birth in the most dangerous country, industrialized country, to give birth in. It's a human rights violation and a human rights issue. And um, when that decision came down, my really good friend and the executive producer of Under God, Roddy Taylor, I don't know if she's here, um, but she called me and, and said, we need to do something. And we have to do it now. There's this lawsuit in Florida happening. Um, there's a rabbi who is suing the state of Florida based on religious freedom as a Jew. This is an infringement on his rights. And that's a really interesting story. And I was like, you know what? That, that, is, that is really hopeful. And that's something to look at. Mm -hmm. So um, we gathered an incredible team. And just from that, from summer till now, we made this film um, wow. to show that these lawsuits are working and are spreading um, across the U.S. and it is a way that we can fight back legally. Yeah. Thank you. Aftershock was such a beautiful film. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Yeah. Um, I think long before I was a filmmaker, oh, <laughs> I'm a New Yorker so I speak loud. Um, long before I was a filmmaker in 1989, I joined a protest in front of the Supreme Court when the court was hearing the Webster case, which was restricting public financing for abortion care. And I think up until that time, I really took abortion rights for granted. I understood there was a fight. It was a while back. And, um, and I saw, though, um, the disproportionate impact, as I was saying before, on poor people. And I realized there was something we could do about it. And I joined um, this protest. It was led by ACT UP. Mm -hmm. um, taking a break from the extraordinary work they were doing to be allies in this, in this struggle. And we all had t-shirts that said, abortion without apology. Mm. And, um, and the power of being in that crowd, you know, I think was really exhilarating. Yeah. You know, and, and understanding that, you know, there were aunties, for sure, out there. Um, but we, we were stronger, and we were more righteous. And... Um, I think that really stayed with me. And you know, a couple years later, when I had an abortion um, in DC, and those aunties were lining the sidewalk with their signs, um, I felt like I held strong because I was in that circle still. And I like to say it's the only time I've ever crossed a picket line. <laughs> um, <laughs> feeling good about it. Um, but I've, I've had that benefit of being able to make that choice for myself about when you know, when to have a child, whether to have a child. I have a son. Um, I had him exactly at the right time with the right person. And, um, and I feel everybody should have that choice. Thank you. I guess I would add at the end of all that come at it from a slightly different way, maybe, is this idea of your name being, <laughs> right? you know, a, <laughs> that you are a chosen one. Um, you know, we've done a lot of Q and A's with the Janes, and we made this movie about them. And all along, it was very important to them that they not be called heroes. Mm. Very important to them. They they said and reset that, um, and that's because they wanted women to feel like they too can do this work, mm -hmm. that they are not extraordinary, that we can all be decent that we can all you know, save each other's lives when the systems are failing. Um, so you know, this is something that we could do you know, as filmmakers. This is what we could contribute. Um, and you know, it's, it's, that's activism. It's about you know, contributing what you can and doing what you can and applying your skill set um, to help save people's lives, which is where we're at right now. 
Um, so, you know, we are not chosen, we are all chosen, and it is all of our responsibility to, to do this work. Those were all such beautiful answers, and we only have an hour, but I, you know, I have like a, there's a shirt that says like introverted, but willing to talk about birth, right? Like that's <laughs> introverted, willing to talk about birth, racial justice, abortion access, like, <laughs> like all of it is my shirt, right? So I'm like trying to tamper um, all of the things that I wanna talk about, but there's a couple of things that I just wanna uplift and like illuminate here that I feel um, are really important, I think, when we have this conversation in this room, but also in our own communities, right? One, is that abortion is traditional, right? This is something much like birth that has been taken from us um, and taken, like, you know, we've been told that we don't have autonomy in how we go about our family planning or lack thereof, right? And so um, your story about Ethiopia really highlighted that to me because Ethiopia is a very traditional country in terms of how they approach healthcare, how they approach birth care, and even abortion access. Um, also, this idea of um, community care, again, is coming to me about how we can't go it alone and how we are all we got, exactly, right? Like, that we can still take care of each other even when the institutions and the systems tell us that we need to like separate ourselves and that we don't have the knowledge, the wisdom, the access to take care of each other. So I really appreciate you all for highlighting that. I appreciate you for bringing your personal stories and experience to the space. Those are sacred. And so I really want to like honor those. Um, in the film Aftershock, <laughs> there's a moment that sticks with me um, where um, the gentleman, like his wife um, died unfortunately due to childbirth related complications and she's his muse, he's an artist, right? And she's his muse. And there's a moment where his little girl looks up at her, oh my gosh, <laughs> looks up at her picture and like says like, look mommy, I made this. Mm -hmm. And so the moment sticks with me because in that whole kind of imagery of this little one talking to the spirit of her mother's, like, in, like her mother's image, right? That's created by her father because he just holds her alive and sacred in this space. There's this impactful moment that speaks to the power of art. And I think through the film, we, we see that a lot because there's so much about these men, like specifically black men, right? Bringing their feelings and their trauma and like their experiences with this crisis to art. And so um, we all know that it's impactful. We know that in the tradition of organizing, art has been an incredible ally, right, to, to progress. So I wanna ask each of you, starting with whoever, I'm trying to figure out how I want to frame the question. What is um, your hope for the impact of your art? Not your goal, not like, you know, cause we all have like a, a list that we write. Like, this is what I wanna, this is where I wanna be. I want to, like premiere at Sundance, right? <laughs> but like, what is the impact that you hope from the storytelling? I, I can start. Yeah, go yeah, I can. I mean, I think one of the, the big things that we wanted to do with this film was contribute to the destigmatization around this issue. I think, um, you know, the silence, it, it, it's been such an effective tool silencing mm -hmm. us and keeping us from talking to each other. You can't organize when you don't communicate. And they've accomplished that by making us feel shame around this issue and not being willing to say on a panel that you've had an abortion, that, it, that there's something wrong with all of that. And that weighs heavy on us. And 
Um, that has really worked for them. Mm. Um, and you know, what we really wanted to do was, was make a film about it, have it be on HBO, say the word, have these conversations, have people in audiences share their stories, sometimes for the first time in front of a room of people, and, and, and fight against that shame factor so that we can get to work now in the ways that we need to. Thank you. Yes, um, thank you for you know, uplifting Aftershock and Omari's artwork and the woman that you're mentioning that passed is Shimani Gibson, so I just want to say her name. And um, I think you know, with Aftershock and with Under God, the goal of art as activism is to make you feel, is to put you in someone else's shoes. So in Aftershock, it was showing the ripple effect of when one mother dies, you know, what happens to her, a, a needless death, a preventable death. Um, what happens to her family, her community, and our country, how it ripples across. And the only way you can see that is by experiencing that person's journey. And the same thing with Ellie in Under God, who, um, who was very grateful to terminate a pregnancy, had an abortion, and would like to have more children, but she right now is choosing not to in Indiana because of, of what's going on there. Um, so I think you know it's seeing another person's story and experiencing it that brings all the statistics and the news articles, all that you know. When you're reading it, it can it can feel like noise, and you don't really understand until you've experienced it as yourself, or you get to watch a film and see what that experience is like and, like and connect with that human being. So I hope that um, people who watch all of our films um, can feel can feel something and become activated through that human. A human connection. I mean, I always have a little bit of imposter syndrome when you, it's like art, and I'm like, ah, what's art? Like, is this art? But like, you know, the, Plan C is a political film, um, and what I hope people walk away with is, uh, you know, first of all, you know, <laughs> honoring the work of Francine and many, many others who have been on the ground, uh, you know, actively, actively trying to increase access and spreading information about access and options, um, that they are stronger by knowing these stories, um, and yeah, and, and to know that they have options. I mean, I, and I also frankly hope that lawmakers will see this and lawmakers will step up, and that's a longer game, but that, you know, states will pass shield laws to prevent protect people who are prescribing across state lines. But at the end of the day, it's about information and people knowing that you know, they have options, they have safe medically, although perhaps not safe legally. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's, it's that, um, giving the hope you know, that they don't have to be forced, to, uh, forced into a pregnancy. Um, and they don't also have to travel, you know, the narrative of traveling to the pills, the pills can come to them. I'll say that, um, you know, we, as we all know, the vast majority of people in this country support expansive abortion rights. And we're, we've hoped that our film, you know, has helped to activate some of those voices because it's not enough to feel it. It's not enough to say it. It's, it's, you have to shout it. And we have to get into the streets as, and, 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 and engage in this struggle. And so um, it's small conversations becoming larger conversations. Um, and we've also, as I find in, inspiration in what Francine does, um, you know, hoping that the Janes will find, that, that people will find some in, inspiration in, in, in the collective resistance, the spirit of resistance of these women um, who, you know, made sacrifices, understood, you know, that it was their moral obligation to save lives. Yeah. Um, and that, that that is something we all need to take on ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. 
you know, Ashley, when you see the film, I hope you all see it. I hope you all come tomorrow, and if not, <laughs> to one of the other screenings. It's really about, it's, it's, it's really about all these intrepid people, uh, mainly clinicians and providers who just stepped up and said, okay, this is crazy, we're gonna make these pills become available. So one was getting the availability, making it a real option in this country that there was another option besides trying to get to a clinic that had been shut down or, get, or having to try to find a doctor who's been threatened with death. So the whole transformational nature of pills Pills that can be mailed to you that, like Tracy keeps saying, it, it, you can take them in your home, they're in your hands, you make decisions as to whether you take them, when you take them, how you take them, who you talk to about them. It's all in your hands. It's no longer a part of a medical system. It's no longer part. That was one of the jobs of Plan C. This film, having a film come out in Sundance with the name Plan C, is like, oh my God, the biggest way of using art to now do what we next need to do, which is to spread the word. We need everybody who sees this film to now just tell somebody else that there is this option, because we don't know who it is that's going to need the access to that option, but if they've heard about it, and they know now to go to the Plan C website, and it's the people in those states where it's the hardest to be able to talk about it, that need to hear about it. And so the opportunity to have something as, as beautiful as an, a movie in Sundance called Plan C that makes everybody want to know, what's, what's this? I mean, I was just in Florida where I, you know, trying to work in Florida, and because I was coming to Sundance, was telling people literally in the streets that I'm going to Sundance on Monday, <laughs> yes. and open conversations in which people were just, <laughs> You know, I look at this one woman who is a shopkeeper, and I'm thinking, she's probably a Republican. She's probably going to bite my head off. And no, she instead said, oh my god, thank you for what you're doing. This is amazing. The opportunity to say, I'm going to send dance to doc because there's a documentary about my work mm. was an opening that we're going to take. We're going to take it to the, whatever it's called, the expression, at, to the <laughs> store. And we're going to make <laughs> art work. In our face. It was very hard to edit Francine sometimes because her, <laughs> her, her, her uh, the way her yeah, my expressions are saying, all mixed up. I know, my um, husband keeps saying, stop, don't do those. What I, I love just hearing the joy, though, that you had around this. You know, it, like, it really buoys me to hear yeah. that and to, you know, I think we all should feel that. It's health care. We should well, feel and, joy about providing health care. And the challenge, I know, for the work of Francine and many others is that there is a lot of censorship happening. There is a lot of being taken down Instagram or ta I mean, there's so much censorship. So getting the word out is not, you know, kind of, you know, it's not as soft as it sounds. It's, it's hard. It's hard because there is censorship happening. Well, and, and also like abortion doesn't have to be, you know, a dreadful, sad, it could be, but it isn't always, you know, it doesn't have to be a trauma. It could be affirmation of, of life, of choices, of, of, of agency, and, and, and communities coming together. I mean, I think that's something else I just take from that. It's like we're, you know, we can find joy in this work. We certainly saw that with the Janes. There, there was so much humor. There was so much playfulness and lightness and levity that we didn't expect. But coming together to do this extraordinary work you know, brought, brought that out. Yeah. yeah, I love the highlighting of joy, right? Because I think one of the tools, right, of the system is to get us downtrodden, get us hopeless, get us exhausted and sick so that we can't then uplift each other and take back our power, right? And, that, and traditionally, that is what has happened. So I really love the highlighting of joy here in the work. Um, and also of like this extreme, beautiful, illuminating hopefulness mm. that this is ours, right? Like this future is ours. So we only have time for one more question. <laughs> I'll make it good. Um, um, yeah, so, oh, wait, I just wanted to highlight one more thing. I'm so sorry, I told you guys, I'm so sorry. Um, yeah, this idea of like not being silent, 
do not let them silence us, right? Because as mother and ancestor Zora Neale Hurston said, if you're silent about your pain, they'll kill you and said that you enjoyed it, right? And so I appreciate you for not, um, for you coming to the table with the gifts and the talents that you have to help us keep our voices out there, keep our stories out there, the power of our stories and our experiences. So in the spirit of resistance, I want us to spend some time imagining what our future is, right? Like I believe that the most revolutionary space is in the imagination space and that if we can imagine ourselves thriving and here in the future, then like that's what fuels our work, right? So I'd love for you to just give me a sentence on when you imagine our future, what is that? Is the question clear? Mm -hmm. Okay. It's a beautiful question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I think I kind of already talked about hope in my first answer. So I don't have one here. But <laughs> to follow up on what you're saying in a sentence, I think, you know, joy and, and um, kindness as resistance is a beautiful notion and, and something to hold on to after the last bunch of years when um, hope has sort of been hard to come by. So I, I, that's something I think I'll take with me from this conversation. If you're going in line, yes. Um, gosh, thank you for the question. We never get asked that. Um, I think I'd love to see, I don't know if I can keep to one sentence, I'll try. I'd love to see not just protecting and defending and, and clawing back you know, abortion rights, but, but expanding them and expanding health care for, 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 for people um, in their reproductive years um, and expanding the opportunities you know, to, to raise families in, in an economically just you know, world. Um, so I, I would love to just stop being on the defensive and and to and to and to build around those imaginings. So thank you for opening that up. Um, I imagine that, or what I hope for. So it's kind of together, imagining and hope is is freedom, right? Freedom of choice, freedom of religion, freedom to be who you are. Because as we know, um, the these draconian abortion restrictions and laws are horrific in itself, but they're also about something much bigger. They're about the lack of separation of church and state. They're about taking away more rights, not that this isn't horrific enough, because it's enough, but it's not stopping here, and we're getting into a very dangerous place where our democracy is being eroded. So I hope that you know we can, we can be free to choose how we birth, when we birth, where we birth, and as women and all people, we can um, have choice. Oh. <laughs> My world will have no borders. There will just no longer be borders, and the differences we will celebrate, we, it's not that we go beyond differences. We love the differences across religions, across race, across countries, across geography, but there will be no borders between them and we will learn from each other and we will pass information and, and everything across it because the borders will no longer be there. Uh, my dream, my hope would be a kind of radical bodily autonomy for everybody so that you can choose choose um, and that that spans you know who you love your gender your expression your health care but you have that that is honored um, and yeah not just picked apart oh, only if you want to wear a mask or only you know but that there's no hypocrisy there we are we have radical bodily autonomy Thank you. <laughs> um, in my future, the world is, society is healed um, from all of the atrocities that 
we have collectively experienced, right? Some more than others. The future is regenerative. I imagine a thriving, beautiful, lush ecosystem. I imagine the earth is abundant, and so are we. And just lots of love, lots of love, love, love. Yeah. <laughs> I think that might be our time. <laughs> okay, we have two minutes. We have time for one question. I'm so sorry to do that all do that to you all, but if anybody, make it good, make it really, really good. If you no have pressure. a question that is burning for our panelists, um, I invite you to stand and just shout. Um, yes. So, um, can I sit or stand? Question? Yeah. Um, thank you for, you know, I'm a man, so, I, <laughs> I, you know, I don't, it's not my choice what yeah. I do, it's their choice. Um, I think, I think, that my question to you is like, there exist people who don't understand the concept of love mm. based on their experiences, based on their, you know, uh, just, just, you know, you can't, you can't control other people. Right. You can only just show by example. So my question really is like, uh, you talked about like the future and what your dreams were like, um, I, I'm, my question is like, uh, basically like, how, how do you, how do you help, how do you help the ignorant people? Like, how do you, mm. how, do you how do you help, how do you help the, the people that are just, I don't know, they're just, you know, in so few words, choosing not to be educated. Yeah. So that's my question to you guys. Mm. Yeah. I'd like to see more men on, on the front lines of this struggle or on the, you know, because your voices are important and needed. You don't have to lead and please don't, but you need to be there and speak, speak your truths and, and be, at, be good allies. Um, and uh, I don't know that we need to, I, mean, I think our, our task is to engage the people that already are with us. Mm -hmm. The vast majority of people are with us. We just need to get them engaged and and mobilized. That's what I'd say. Yeah. I was just going to include in that you know that it it's it affects everybody. All people and all people have abortions. Men, women have abortions. People have abortions, and people know somebody who has an abortion. So I'm just kind of lifting up from the also the gendered space. It really isn't like a somebody else over there, and it's all of us. So I want to honor that. Yeah. yeah, just to echo, you know, and it's it's abortion, <laughs> and um, it's beyond abortion, and it will affect everybody. Um, whether it's physically or being in this country where we lose our democracy and lose our choice. Um, you know, there's always a canary in the coal mine, but it's gonna come for everyone if we don't do something. So um, the people who think it's not affecting them, it actually is. Can I offer something? <laughs> um, another thing that's coming to mind that I think I talk about a lot is this idea that like, I love what you guys are saying, like it's going to affect everyone, right? But like when we talk about especially like communities that have been made disposable, right? Like there's this idea of this like them versus us when the truth is, is that the system that we're living under is like the biggest lie, right? Especially to white America is that racism serves them. Right, because racism, white supremacy, capitalism, all of the things that are impacting these systems and killing us, right, are also killing y'all too. And so I think that when I think of the future, this regenerative future, I think of the idea that like there will be a lot more truth telling. And because only in the truth can we heal, right? And so once we stop, um, once we stop abiding by the untruths that the systems have told us, 
And that comes from people who have these gifts of storytelling, being loud, getting on the megaphone, coming to the cinema cafe, coming to these panels, these conversations, stopping people in a drugstore in Florida, right? And talking to them, then we can start to realize like we can start to spread truth. And they're hard truths, but they're healing truths as well. Because it's the only way that we're going to get to the place that we need to be, which is like a healed land, a healed ecosystem. All of that is if that if we stop subscribing to the fact that the system serves some of us and not others, and the ones who it doesn't serve are disposable. Right? So what I say to your question is don't shut up, right? Watch the Janes, watch Plan C, watch Aftershock, watch Under God, watch all of these, and then bring people to watch those films and bring people to have these hard-ass conversations, excuse my language, but they're hard, and then challenge. I want, like, interrogation all the time, not in, like, the police state way, right? But, like, interrogating ourselves and our notions about what life is and what society is all the time and doing that at our dinner tables. I think that's the only way. <laughs> no, 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 no. I appreciate you all so much for being here. Thank you for your work. Thank you for your community. I appreciate you all for being part of this family. Have the conversations. I'm speaking for you, so tell me if I'm wrong. Stop them on Main Street if you see them. Talk to them. Ask your questions because I went over time and didn't give you time for questions. I appreciate you. Love, love, love. Peace, peace, peace.